We won't go with the sunglasses. We certainly All right. We're doing episode six in five, four, three, two. Welcome to the Stew Pot, episode six. Lou Marconi is your host, and I brought in with me a very special guest and a very good friend. Chris Jackson, a.k.a. Q-Ball Carmichael. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. How you doing, man? Hey, good, brother. It's good to see you, man. Been a long time. Been a long time. Yeah. So, yeah, I've been back for almost four years now, back in Ohio. I know, right? It's it's crazy how, how, how fast time goes. I mean, we've stayed in touch, but, you know, we got to see each other when you lived down here a lot more and, at wrestling shows and things before we we both went our separate ways from wrestling but you know it's good to see you and of course you know yeah i'm the god my wife and i are the godparents of your firstborn and uh, yep. you know it's it's always a pleasure man always a pleasure thank you thank you i'll tell you what the interesting thing is too is that we first met in 98 in steel city wrestling and you came up with the Virginia crew. I'm not mistaken. It was you, uh, Jimmy Cicero, Julio. Was Julio with your crew? Julio, yeah. Julio. And um, uh, Christian York and um, Joey Matthews. Right. Who became Joey Mercury eventually. Yeah. That yeah. was that yeah. was the crew. Cicero and I had trained Mercury and Matthews. And, and they came in shortly after we did. And uh, gosh, you know, I was talking with Don Montoya yesterday about the crew that we had at Steel City. And, you know, when you went to Steel City, you never cared who you're up against on the roster because every single guy in that locker room could go. You weren't going to have a bad match. The pit bulls were brought in a lot. Uh, Stevie Richards and the Blue Meanie, um, also Supernova. A lot of guys brought in that were there for a minute or two. But, you know, you guys like you and me, when we had the shirts that listed the 10, the 10 guys, we were all on that list of the, you know, the, the stars sort of a Steel City. And they had a great TV spot. And I yeah. would have people from Cleveland, Cleveland call me and go, hey, we're watching Steel City. Where? Are, oh, wait, there you are. You're coming out now. <laughs> yeah. You know, we had, good, we had good TV. It was sort of a weird thing because. He'd walk down the street in, in Pittsburgh or Cleveland, and people would recognize you. And I'm like, yeah. Jesus, this must, be, this must be what it's like to be Hogan every day of the year. It was crazy. Well, I remember, like, I told Christine this, and she, because she didn't know me back then. She didn't meet me until 2009. But, yeah, back then, we went to restaurants or bars in Pittsburgh. People recognized us and asked us for autographs. Oh, yeah. You know, we, had, we worked for Steel City. We worked for a Jim Miller's NWA group. We worked for uh, Allied Powers, Chris Lash. And, you know, at one time I had Steel City heavyweight title. I had the Allied Powers TV title. And then we worked for Sal Conti. I don't know if you ever came in there, but it was United States Championship Wrestling. And he had a great TV spot. So you are working for three or four groups out of Pittsburgh. And three or four of them all had television. So, and the TV went, you know, from Pittsburgh to Cleveland, which is not which is just a hop, and all over Western PA and all over Ohio area around Cleveland. And it was funny yeah, because you'd walk down the street and you would really be recognized as a wrestling superstar. It was weird. Like you said, we go in bars and restaurants. People be like, oh, I got it. You don't have to worry about buying or, you know, I'll buy your drinks or whatever the case may be. It was a, it was really an awesome time to be in wrestling and, and that was, you know, during the Attitude Era where wrestling was just on fire. You were working the western side of, of Pennsylvania and the Gund Arena for WWE. And me and Cicero were working New York, Long Island, Philadelphia, D.C., uh, uh, Madison Square Garden. So we're all working for WWE, which was then WWF from like 96 to, to 2000 when they bought WCW. But we all got a lot of TV time and Gosh, you know, it was so much fun, and it was, it was just, you were just hustle, 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 hustle. But, you know, everybody, everybody in every group that we worked at pretty much could go. And if they, if they couldn't go and they were green, they would at least listen to you. Yeah. Well, we talked about that, too. You could have put anybody interchangeably in that locker room in the ring, and we'd have to match. Anybody. Yeah, it you would have worked. 
you never worried about it, you know. Yeah. As things progressed in the, in the 2000s, the millennium came. And when I moved to North Carolina in 2009, and I'd get booked, I would ask, I would ask the promoter, hey, who are you going to book me with? Just, you know, to make sure, because there's a lot of guys that were out there that, that went through 10 minutes of training and left and thought they were a wrestler. And, you know, if I'm going to work that guy, let me know ahead of time because I'm going to do something special with him. Yeah. Well, the thing, too, because it wasn't too long after that, in 2011 or 2012, I went to Manny's camp in Columbia, South Carolina. Manny yep. Commander, NWA legend. It was me, it was you, it was Pat Cusick, and a couple other Manny guys. And I was working with them, and Manny was correcting stuff I was doing for all these years because I was protecting myself on the end right. of the yeah. Right. It was, it was Pete Casa, and then there was um, Brandon. Brandon Shooter yeah. from Oklahoma. Yeah, Brandon, Brandon. Groom. Yeah. yeah. Groom. Brandon Groom. Yeah, Brandon. Yeah, he was a – well, yeah, Pete's doing really good. I guess Pete's getting – he's going to have his first child. I just saw it on Facebook. I'm real happy for him. I, yeah, I did run into you know, Pete Houston after that, and he looked awesome. He looked great. Yeah, Pete. Pete was gigantic. The only thing Pete didn't have going for him is size. You know, you and I were both six feet or over. And, you know, Pete had a great physique, but he was about 5'7". And he got stuck yeah, he in that, that zone of, yeah, not quite tall enough. And, and Brandon Groom, man, he was a shooter. He could have went with anybody. That, that kid probably should have had a contract, you know, 20 years ago, 18 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever. Well, there, there, there's there's another thing, too. Back when we were working for WWE, these opportunities that these young guys are getting on NXT now, or we're getting, they weren't there 25 years ago. That wasn't happening. No. 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 Plus, they, we were told that we weren't big enough, and those guys were half my size wearing world title belts in that promotion. I'm going, get it. Right? <laughs> it was funny, you know. I remember the first time I went up there, I got Ron and Don Harris on one side of me who were about 6'6". Six, six. I got the Undertaker and Kane on the other side of me, and Cicero standing across from me. I looked at Cicero. I said, "Geez, this is the land of the giants." You know, yeah. dude, we were all big guys on the independent. You know, you'd be six one, six two in your boots, and you'd be two hundred sixty pounds. You were a big dude, but you, when you went up there back in that attitude era, you you were just an average sized guy. It was crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah you were just the way it was. Um, another thing too, I think. Al Snow put this very well, like what we saw back starting around the 2000s, maybe even started back in the early 90s with the denigration of the business. And more and more people got into the business that had no business being in the business, if you wanted to go. Um, the thing that gets me today, and I want, to, I want your thoughts on this, is a lot of terminology gets thrown around that people use these terms that, that are inside terms in wrestling, but they think they know what they mean and they don't. You know, that's what I wanted to really talk to you about because I know, like, like what they say, shoot, or they say mark, or they say bump, or they say cape. We'll go through those four. You know, explain to people first off what is cape. We'll start there. What is cape? Cape is, and I just explained this to a guy the other day. Cape was when the business was protected and policed by the wrestlers. We didn't let the two faced out of the tube. We told everybody, my family never knew wrestling was a work. I never smartened up anybody. I never did. Because the job for me was to protect the business and let people think everything that ha was happening to me was legitimate. You know, we when people walked in the locker room, we'd speak in carny. They wouldn't understand us. And when we went out, heels never went out with baby faces. It was always separate. You never went to the same place. You never rode together, and if you did, you dropped the guy off of the back side of the building and you pulled around to the front. What we did is Kayfabe was basically keeping everybody else in the dark about the business and letting them suspend belief and think that we were really out there killing each other. And that was Kayfabe to me. Yeah. Sure. That's why, like, the Dark Side of the Ring episode that just aired was David Schultz. I watched it. Yeah, I watched it, too. I remember yeah. when it happened. <laughs> it was just like, wow. That was the worst guy to ask that question. <laughs> well, you know, I think he got set up. I think Vince put him out there because Vince knew he was volatile. And Vince knew that with his life, he would protect the business. 
And when Stossel asked him that question, there was no debate on what what he was going to do. There was no debate on what Schultz was going to do. Schultz was going to jack slap the taste out of his mouth if he asked him about wrestling being fake because, you know, people say it's fake. I say it's predetermined sports entertainment because you know the injuries that we sustained over the years. They were massive. I mean, I broke my neck. I broke my back. I broke nine fingers, both hands, both wrists. I mean, it's crazy. A broken elbow. I mean, it's a it's a rough business. And so we didn't take kindly to somebody saying the word fake was really offensive to us. So what I would have done with Schultz, if I was Vince, if he slapped the taste out of Stoss' mouth, I would have given him this 280 grand, and I would have made David Schultz a star. And I would have made people believe the business is real. He would have been my ticket to making the business real. Whether whether Vince fought over a ticket tax and it was sports entertainment or whatever, I would have put that guy on top and he would have been my top heel. I would have just paid the money and made him my top heel. And let me tell you something. People would have believed it after they saw that. Instead of selling him out down the road and let him take the beating himself and blackballing him from the business and he had to go be a bounty hunter, I mean, I yeah. think the opposite would have... I think the opposite would have changed the business, and I think it would have been the right thing to do. And let's face it, at that period of time, two hundred eighty grand to Vince was like near you giving each other twenty eight dollars. Yeah, yeah, it was nothing. It was, it was yeah, nothing. it really pissed me off that a guy that went out there and did what he was supposed to do, what he was trained to do to police and protect the business, got thrown under the bus. Cheap shot oh. from cheap shot. Yeah, and. Um, the other, the other thing too was Eddie Mansfield, who was a nobody. Oh yeah, did that he whole was thing. And um, I mean, he was there's another guy on a Morton Downey Jr. show. I sent that clip to you. That was Jim Wilson. Yeah, I think Georgia. He was another nobody. Well, those guys had no chance of going any further than mid card indie status, or maybe occasionally getting a gig to just get squashed. So they were they had no future in the business. They didn't work out. They weren't in shape. They didn't put the effort in. And you know, typical guy today, I love the business. Well, there's so many people in the business that shouldn't be in there. If you really love the business, you should quit the business. Because the people that used to be on the other side of the door are now on the locker room side of the door and it's tainted the business terribly. So really, you know, Eddie Mansfield is a nobody. Why anybody would listen to a nobody? I mean, he'd go, he would go out there and lie. It didn't matter to him. He was trying to get a payday, and he was pissed off because he wasn't getting pushed. You know, the t- typical crybaby indie guy who actually got five minutes of fame and used it to exploit the business. Let me tell you something. What is, in my, my, my opinion, he's always going to be one of the biggest, biggest pieces of shit that ever walked the face of the earth. Yeah, I don't know exactly. if I can say that on the podcast. But. Yeah, you can swear. It's okay. He's a piece of shit. He is. It's, it's terrible. And the thing the thing about Eddie, guys like Eddie Mansfield, Jim Wilson, it, he said he was doing it for the boys. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, what, what, how, I, that, that, I didn't see the logic in that. I was like, no, you did it for you. That's what, just, just, just be up front about it. You did it for you. So, sure. And he, right. And he's going to defend it. Well, I did it for the boys. No, you didn't. You didn't do the boys any favors at all. If anything, you did damage to the business. So you didn't do it for the boys. If you did it for the boys, you would have policed the business. You would have told those guys to fuck themselves. And you wouldn't have done it. You know? He didn't do it for the boys. Like you said, he did it exactly for himself. Period. And if he wasn't getting pushed, he wasn't happy with what he was. Maybe he could have went to a guy that was getting pushed. Or maybe he would have went to somebody went to a horse. What do I need to do? What do you need me to do to better myself? What do I need to do to better myself? Get to where I'm Let me put in that extra. Instead, he, he took he did that. So, yeah, so, took, took a lot. Yeah, yeah. Takes, a lot, takes a lot more effort to do that though. Well, kayfabe, like think about the thing, the whole thing with kayfabe. People like there, there's a there's sites on Facebook called the Cult of Kayfabe, kayfabe News or kayfabe. I'm like, I, it just I just shake my head because I came in in '93. You came in ten years before me. So I'm not to say, but you look younger than me. I don't understand that. Um, Let me tell you. Let me tell you something. If I'd have broke kayfabe when I came into business, you there, my body would have been found in. It may be found in the ocean off Hawaii, but probably never found. Right, but you know what I mean. If you were fucking kayfabe, yeah. you got like that. 
They're back in the yeah. day, guys that wore masks in the ring, when they left the arena, they had their masks on. In street yeah. Yeah. That, that, that I remember. I've seen guys do that. I'm gonna run off of as well. You, you wore that hook. So Billy, yeah. how many times? How many times did you see Mill Maskeris out of his mask? Never. The rest of my oh. case. <laughs> no, I never did. Dick, um, Dick Pryor, the destroyer. Yeah, exactly. You know, those guys were protecting the business. Yep, they're protecting the business, and it's cr- it's crazy. And you know, it's so different today. And you know, one of the things that 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 I hate is when a guy comes up to you, and this has happened to me probably twenty five times in my career. Oh, I'm a worker from South Carolina. Okay, listen. The word worker, the term worker, is never used in a self-egregious fashion. I've never called myself a worker. When somebody was trying to get me into a promotion, they'd be like, hey, you ought to check out my buddy Q-Ball. He's a really good worker. That was never a term designed to describe yourself. That was a term that another wrestler used to describe you to a promoter, to put you over to the promoter. Hey, he's a hell of a worker, man. You should bring him in. You never went and said, oh, I'm a worker. Look, I've always told people I'm a wrestler, plain and simple. That's it. I've never once referred to myself as a worker. I don't do it in my writing, and I don't like it. And it's a term that was never once used to describe a person of themselves. It was used by another person to put you over to a promoter or to another wrestler. That's it. That's simple. And and I can't stand it when guys do it. I see it all the time on Facebook, you know, oh, guys told me I was a pretty good, you know, I had a good match. I'm a good worker. Uh, look, you don't call yourself that. That's, that's reserved for somebody else referring to you. So another one of those words that's misused and drives me nuts. Yeah, I remember that. That drives me nuts. And the other one is shoot. You talk about the shoot. What, what exactly does the shoot mean? You can go right ahead. The what? Shoot. Oh, shoot. Oh, jeez. You know, look, it's, I told Dave Feinstein, or, or, or Rob Feinstein, sorry. I told him one time when he, when he sent me a thing about a shoe video. I said, look, dude, my whole life's a shoot. What are you talking about? You know what I mean? I mean, I don't understand shoot video. You may talk about things that happen behind the scenes and things like that. When somebody says, oh, that match was a shoot, no, it wasn't. That promo was a shoot, no, it wasn't. That doesn't, that doesn't have any place in the business. That's when you see Greg Valentine go in with a punk 35 years ago, put him in a figure four and actually break his leg because he doesn't belong in the business. That's a shoot. <laughs> you know, anything else over and above that is a shoot is one of the most misused terms in professional wrestling, man. Yeah, I can't say it. People come up and do a video, do a live video and go, this is a shoot video. I'm like, oh my God, no. <laughs> well, you see like interviews, like they do interviews like, for instance, Arn Anderson on a podcast is talking about Bobby Eaton or anybody. It doesn't matter who it could be anybody, but for example, this Arn Anderson shoots on Bobby Eaton. And I'm like, you're just reading that. That's like, it makes it sound like you're saying something bad about him. He's not. He's actually putting him over. He's saying a lot of good things about him. Because Bobby Eaton, I never heard anybody say a negative thing about Bobby Eaton. So, no. So it's just one of those things. It's like, oh, or, you know, Vince, you know, Lanny Popo shoots on Vince McMahon. It's like, wait, wait a second. That's not what that word means. That's not at all what that word means. It tries to no. Because there's a, there's a local sports guy here in Cleveland. His name's Ken Carmen. He's a sports radio host. And he uses these terms. He's a big, he, he's a big wrestling fan. He is. I know who he is. I know who he is. And he always says, "Don't I, I got myself worked into a shoe. And I'm like, I want to smack him when he says that. If I think, you've never put on a pair of wrestling boots in your life, never been in a ring, never taken a fall, you've never trained, you do not have the place to say anything like that. Nobody knows what the hell you're talking about. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. Right. Yeah, that's another thing that drives you crazy when people from other avenues and never lay stuff in a pair of boots start, start using wrestling terms. And you're like, okay, look, you, you might know the vernacular from looking up on the internet, but you don't know it from living the life that we did. People don't understand, you know, in, in, in the 90s, it was nothing to wrestle 100 nights a year, 120, 30 nights a year for us. I mean, we were busy. We were meeting ourselves coming and going. 
it was tough to get to a gym and work out and tan and do the right things. We were on the road constantly. You know, we do a Monday and Tuesday with the WWE after we came off of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three day, three day clip, you know, and it was crazy. And you'd hear guys, you know, I would do a lot of radio shows, a lot of remote and the radio guys thought they were smart. So they used the wrestling terms and I'd get right on their shit right away and say, look, you don't have the right to use that term. You never laced up square boots. You never got in the ring. You never got stiffed by somebody by accident. You never got tatered, whatever the case is. You know, you never took a bump and felt it for the next week. So don't be using those terms. You don't, you don't know them. You might have looked them up. You think you're, you're cute by using them, but don't use them. Because all it does is make you want to come through this and beat your ass. Right. And the other thing, too, this was the most interesting. You let me, I think, is the best book for anybody to read that wants to get into business or in the business. Hooker. Okay? It's Muthaz's biography. It's a great, great book. One of the things that I caught from it, I learned from it, was when Muthaz was talking about these terms that people use. He said, we never said that back in the day. We never said shit. We just said we're just going to rustle. That's all. Rustle. That's all he said. That's all. And that the handshakes and all this other stuff, I think that stuff was a rip, in my opinion, based on what I read from Tez. What did he tell you when you trained with him? You know, he never used any of those terms, ever. He just used the term to wrestle. And he just told me, he said, look, the time I spent with him, he said, look, when you get in there with a guy that thinks he's king crap, you put him in a move and you let him know in the first couple of minutes of that match that if it was a shoot, you would beat his ass. Let him know. And that was pretty much what Lou said. Otherwise, he, it was, he never used any kayfabe or inside terms or anything. He took for granted that people that he trained were going to do what they were supposed to do. Not talk to people about the business. You know, don't, let any, don't smarten up anybody to the business. And that was pretty much it. I mean, he was never into really a lot of terminology. He really wasn't. No, and they, I think even like my mentor, the man that trained me was Charlie. He never really told me this stuff. I learned it as I got on shows. And I sure. learned Charlie as I worked shows. I didn't yep. learn it that way. So it was, it was interesting. So he just kind of said, yeah, he, he said, you pick it up as you go. He, that's, so that was his way. And he just, it's good that you don't start. Because I don't think he, or that, remember that, that stupid handshake that everybody had to do with that really, oh, I, stopped doing it. Yeah. I stopped doing it after about a year or two. And, no. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was never taught that by Lou. I was taught it in Hawaii, you know, to, to let somebody that you meet know you know the business, do the kayfabe handshake. But, you know, that thing went out a long time ago when people got smartened up to it. And so, you know, I just never did it. You know, we always shook hands like men, and, and that's just the way it was. And, uh, you know, but there was, there was that little thing that went around for a long time, and I think Larry Sharp put out a little pamphlet in the back of the wrestling magazine. You know, the hundred terms you need to know to be in the wrestling business, 1095. That was back in the early 90s, late 80s, and a lot of people bought it. And, you know, guys got in the business, started to use the cave man shake, and other people look at me, what the, you know, you do. And it was just one of those things where it was not really done. Maybe in the 70s, but not in the 80s and definitely not in the 90s, you know. I mean, people thought they were cool and tried to do it, but, I mean, it just it just was one of those things that just I don't think fit in the business. Yeah. Well, it just kind of goes to show, I think a lot of that, those terms that are out now were rich with newer guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was kind of like, okay, you know, like, if you see, like, like, one time, Ricky Morton told a guy to hit him with a donut hole. The guy didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But he was yeah. just all like, or he told me once, I worked him once at WrestleCade, and he said, give me a turnbuckle. And I didn't know what he meant, which meant just whip him across the ring into the other turnbuckle. That's all he had to say to me, and I would have known to do it. So, but he was, you know, but he talked about a guy's experience with Ricky Morton, but he, you know, Sometimes they'll save stuff, get them to rib you. You know, they will. They'll just do things that just yeah. kind of mess. So, yeah, the, the handshake thing was a bother. But I think I think the problem is, and this is just me thinking, with social media the way it is now, because what really killed kayfabe was technology. It wasn't Eddie Man. Yeah. It wasn't the report. Yeah. It was the technology. Internet. Yeah. The internet. We killed it. That's why the business is There's where no it's at. Much. 
What's that? I'm going that to uh, walk while we talk and get some Motrin because I have been working outside all day. We moved. I don't know if I told you. Um, about a mile up the road from where we live, but a lot of a lot of outside work and getting bicycles ready for the girls, the Abby and the girl next door, and just a lot of bending over today. And you know when you do that, after all the years we've been. Brother, I hate to say it, but you feel it. I'm, I'll be 60 in June. So I got about a month left of being 59, and then I'm going to the 60 category. And the stupid thing is I still try to do what I used to do, but, man, I pay for it. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm going to be 47 in June. <laughs> yeah, like I think when I'm... Um... Yeah, you're right between Rihanna and I. She, I'm the 10th, she's the 25th. You're like the 17th or 16th or something? 19th. 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 And you were in the teens. It's Calista. Calista's the 19th, too. My, my daughter, my youngest, was born on the 19th. Well, that's back, funny. Uh, well, that was done. I, I told Jimmy Lee this one last time. We planned it because we, we had to induce Christine. And I said, I don't mind sharing a birthday. So it was like a, su- a Sunday night. It was the 18th. So we induced her that night. And they the next morning. One, they almost didn't take us because. They were afraid they were going to induce her into a C-section. I pretty much talked to her and said, hey, we're here. We got this all. Let's go through it. Fine. You're not going to have a C-section after your birth. Isabella, 22 months ago, she was 9 pounds, 9 ounces. But I guess there were some complications because the cord was wrapped around her neck. Did I tell you that? Was, yeah. You told me. Yeah. yeah. Well, it would have, it would have, who knows what would have happened. But if she lied on one side, the heart would drop. But when she lied on the other side, the heart rate came back up. They said the cords around her neck stay on this side. They almost did a C-section, but they had to do a vacuum-assisted birth. And who knows what would have happened if we would have waited until she went to actual natural labor. So, well, so we, we, back, back we, we did, you, you didn't, so we don't have to think about that. Well, back to it. When she was born, it was a vacuum-assisted birth. It was 9 o'clock in the morning, and she didn't cry right away. It felt like forever, but it was about 10 seconds before they got her to cry. And I'm sitting there thinking, my heart sank. Oh, that's what's scary. And this, this was my birthday, right? This, we did this. We planned this for my birthday. And, and as soon as she cried, I kind of like, you know, all this emotion. Relieved. It was yeah, relieved. Like, I shed a little bit of a tear. I'm like, is she going to be okay? And she said, yeah, she's good. And they kind of looked at me. They saw the emotion on my face. And they said, this is your first. And then Christine said, no, it's our second. And then I made the joke, well, it's the second one that I know about. And everybody laughed at her. Because there's a room full of people. I mean, we had, like, a whole crew in there to give birth to the child. And the, the, they, once they got her out, they got the cord off, and they brought her over. And she, she wasn't crying. Yeah. You should tell them they cry well, as soon as they come out. And those, that is few, those few moments are terrorizing. Oh, yeah. They, they, they stick in your head, huh? I'm doing some some work with uh, EDMR for people with PTSD, and those are the moments that re- replay in your head constantly, you know. And you got to get that loop, that loop that plays. It's a loop that plays when you you go to you, you know you have a moment during the day where you think about it. And it started with Rhiannon being in that bad car accident a year ago and getting rear-ended, and all she could think every time she drives or I drive. It took me six months to get her to drive after the accident. And all she thinks about is getting Miranda again. It replays. And we were able to get to the most renowned PTSD doctor in the East Coast. And he diagnosed her with severe PTSD from the accident. So she's getting treatment. But I'm actually taking an EDMR course to work with people with PTSD. So that's good. I don't have good. enough going on, right? I got two YouTube shows, uh, police officer, Amazon business. Uh, Doing my buddy's podcast. I just don't have enough going on, man. <laughs> yeah, we could talk about, yeah, you got the one as the truth buster one. I like that. I like that. Yeah, you, you know, we here's what we had to do. John is John Stewart's positive for COVID-19, as is his wife, his dad, and his dad's girlfriend. They're all doing really, really well. But I had an additional show called Cue Ball and the Birdman. So I had three shows. So I had to cut one, and I told John, take the name. And get somebody to help you host the show and do the pod, do, or at least do a podcast on Truthbusters. I really wanted to do it, but when it came down to it, I'm like, I can't do three shows, be a cop, have an Amazon business, 
uh, do everything that I do and do three shows a week. I, I just, I can't do it. It's, it's too, um, it's just too much. So I had to cut one. So I cut Truth Busters as a weekly one, but I think we're going to do it once every couple of weeks or once every three weeks, we're going to do a Truth Buster still. But I just couldn't do it every week. Well, there, there's a, because the thing that I, I, earlier today, you know, Christine worked and I took my girls over to, to my, my parents. They wanted to see a it the first time we were able to do that in Long Island, Ohio just started opening back up. And I kind of got into it with my dad. It wasn't a big deal. You gotta understand my dad. He argues, but it's over. It's a bunch of dumb. Yeah. And it was about, because there's a lot of information coming out about the virus now. That I know you're making What's that? I know your parents. Yeah. Well, it's just kind of like that. There's a lot of information coming out about the virus now that people are starting to say, hey, was this response really appropriate for the threat versus what we could have done? Was there a medium? Was there an in-between? Did we really have to shut everything down the way we did? Was the, was the predictive model right? And that's all I was just talking to him about. He goes, you know, and he got mad because, boy, people are going to die. And I said, on average, 7,000 people will die a day in the United States just with any just everyday stuff. So, I mean, you can't just sit at home. I mean, when they when they say, when the government tells you when it's safe, you can go out, then that means nothing because it's never really 100% safe. So I, I'm trying to figure out what, and the thing that scares me too is how quickly they were able to capitalize on this, people that were power hungry. And you got people that are armed storming capitals now because they're pissed. <laughs> and it's just... That's really what it is. I'm not, I'm not going to do what they did. However, that's, that's the reason why we had the system set up the way it was. Because when you start pulling this crap, we're armed. And we're not going to put up with it. So well, you know, what, here's, here's, tell me what you think. Well, here's the thing is, you know, if you check the CDC, it, it's, not, it's not confirmed yet. But the 2017-18 flu virus killed 61,000 people in America alone. The flu. Mm -hmm. The flu of 2014-15 killed 51,000 people. So mm -hmm. this is going to kill, you know, this has about a two and a half percent, depending where you're at, a death rate, which is normal for the flu. It's just that this is a biological flu, not a natural flu. There's no vaccine. There's no shot for it. So what it did is it caused the panic. And I understand why it caused the panic and the social distancing and the mask when you go out. I sent you a picture of all of us in our masks and everything. And I get it. But I also see so many cops. And, and, you know, I see a few that have gotten it and a few have not made it from it, but it's a small amount. It's a small amount of people overall. If you look at the death rate in North Carolina, I mean, we've got 86,000 or 9,600 cases and we've had 400 deaths. Do the math on that. It's a very fractional marginal percentage. It's no right. different than the regular flu. But because we don't know anything about this, the government decided to react early and I think it was appropriate. I think the overall thought process, and I'm not a big government guy. I think in general, the government lies to us and tells us what they want. They feed the media a bunch of bullshit. They, it's a mushroom theory. Keep us in the dark and cover us in bullshit. And so I'm not a big government guy. I don't, I don't have a lot of faith in the political system or the government system as it is today, as it was 150 years ago, 50 years ago, yes. But today, no. So for me to say that I think the government acted appropriately is a strong statement because I don't want to say I'm anti-government because I'm not. I'm not going to be an expatriate and live in Portugal or some stuff like that. I'm just not a big supporter of the government because doing truth busters and looking behind the scenes and talking to epidemiologists and talking to people about COVID and getting the actual facts, you know, those facts were not given out by the federal government. The facts that I got from the number one virologist in the United States of America, who didn't want to air, didn't want to go on the air, but gave us the facts about the virus, where it was made, manufactured, how it was delivered to Wuhan labs, and who had control of it, was mind blowing because the government has never told us that. You know, yeah, they're, they're starting. It's starting to come out now. Did you also see? Did you ever hear about that video that the doctors in Bakersfield, California, where they had their raw data of the thousands of patients they treated? And they were going over the percentage and they said it's nowhere near what they said it was. And they said, this is just raw data, it's not scientific. We're not saying this is not. I saw that. Yep. I saw because that. Because the, the local media wanted them to hold a press conference. So they did. 
And there's been a few other studies showing a lot more people have the antibodies than they expected. So the infectious rate went a lot higher. It probably was here a lot longer. Yeah. Honestly, I took my dad. I honestly thought, I thought I had it. I look back at, I remember I got really sick in January. It lasted about four or five days. Christine had a cough she couldn't get rid of. Our daughters were ran a few fevers here and there, but we're like, I wonder if we had it. I'm just kind of curious. Or maybe it was just well, a flu. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story about that is about uh, maybe three weeks ago, a month ago, Rhiannon went to the physical therapist's office and they took her temperature and it was 101.7. And she had been feeling pretty bad for a couple of days. So I went over, they asked me to bring my thermometer because they're a physical therapist and they thought, well, maybe ours is on the blink. Went over, nope, 101.7. Me went to our local doctor who came, oh, they all came out in the parking lot. They tested her. We waited in a the car. They came back and they said, you're negative. But this doctor's a personal friend of ours. I'm not going to mention the name, but said there's a 30 percent error rate on the test. So we can only be 70 percent sure you don't have it. Well, she had a fever that continued on and off for four or five days. Uh, she felt really fatigued. She was achy, almost like the regular flu. Um, and then she popped out of it. I didn't get it. My blood type typically does, is not prone to get coronavirus, and Abby has my blood type, thank God. So neither of us had any problems with it. But John right. Stewart from Drew Thrusters, John and his his girl, his uh, wife Joanne had it, and all they said is they had he didn't even have a fever. He had a head cold and diarrhea, and she had a head cold and a little bit of fever. Nothing went to her chest. Um, a little bit of diarrhea, and they both were diagnosed with it, but the doctor said you probably had it three weeks, you're out of the woods, and they had really minor symptoms. I mean, symptoms <laughs> that you would normally think, I got a bug, you know, nothing more. Yeah. So I think I think the degree of severity of the COVID panic is way out of proportion. But I do know one thing from what I've watched on CNN, what I've researched on uh, Truthbusters is that it has a higher – Fatality rate with African Americans and Hispanic people over Caucasian people for some reason. It's a, it's a, it's a exorbitantly high. It's like 60 for 65 percent more of those people who get it actually die. So I didn't you know, know, course, never heard that. My, my head goes to, oh my God, government conspiracy. They know how many travelers live in China. The CIA went and dropped the virus because we still have a copy of it. They wanted to blame it on China to create a trade war and the tariffs. They wanted to be able to manufacture stuff in the U.S. So they dropped there knowing that the business people come working all over would spread the virus. They're going to make a big deal about the virus. They're going to make it. They're going to call it the Chinese virus by Trump. Not a mistake. Not a misspoken word to blame it on China. So China is going to be responsible for reparations, just like in World War II, when the Japanese bombed the Philippines, they paid over a billion dollars in reparations. Uh, the U.N. ordered it, and now the reparations for China would be in the trillions. It would be the stimulus that we got and everything else. And my head is going through, oh, my gosh, this is a government conspiracy planted here. All the government people are getting that 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 apparent, apparent drug that, that makes you immune to it. They're all getting it. We're not getting it, but they're getting it. Here's the conspiracy. They want to eliminate some of the illegal aliens who are mostly Hispanic, and they want to relieve some of the people that are either crime-ridden or in, in, in the projects or in the HUD housing or whatever, which is predominantly African-American, not to be negative, but it's true. And so my head goes right to the government trying to thin out the population. The new world order wants to get rid of the people that might be a dredge on the system. So that's immediately where my head goes because I'm always on the conspiracy edge of things because the government has lied to us so much over the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, you know, it's incredible. The reason why JFK was shot is amazing. I mean, most people don't even understand why they killed him. And he was killed by our government. He was killed for a reason. They just pinned it on another guy. But, you know, everybody knows there were two shots from the grassy knoll. Most people don't know why he was killed. I believe I do. But, you know, so I go to conspiracy immediately with the federal government because they've been involved in so many over the years and they've not come clean on any of them. So for me, I mean, you go all the way back to Roswell in 1947. Seriously, you're going to tell us three days later it's a weather balloon? Come on, man. You know, how, this, how am I supposed to trust a government that lies to the people? It's supposed to be yep. the people for the people, by the people. No taxation without representation. I got million-dollar million year congressmen who work a four-year term and get retirement for the rest of their life. 
that didn't have to subscribe to Obamacare when it was mandatory. And these guys are the ones that are supposed to represent me. I'm sorry, but that's not representative of a guy who struggles to get by, keep a roof over his head and feed his family. So you get somebody in there making $45,000 a year or $60,000 a year like the rest of us, and that's the person that represents me. So I do not trust the government. I don't trust what they tell us ever. I think they always have an alternative motive. You know, there's always people that have some kind of hidden agenda or ulterior motive. And there's no bigger person that has that than our government. And they'll feed the fake news, Fox and all the fake news people exactly what they want to tell them. And those those people sit in front of their TV and believe every damn thing they see. They won't go and try to work hard for three hours on the Internet to get a hold of somebody who knows what they're talking about and have a conversation with them. Because it's just too easy to accept what's put on the TV. And what's put on the TV is fed by the government to the media who puts it on there. And it's all bullshit. I was, but, just gonna, I was just going to say the media has been lying to us too. I mean, it's oh, been, oh, there, oh, yeah, oh God, well, don't trust the media. No, no, you got to do your own research and get your own and get the facts and really look through things because you know. They, sure. they, I look, I look at it as if, if they can, they're doing their best to control. So what scared me about this whole panic was how quickly everybody acquiesced to do this because they thought they were doing yeah. something they're good. They're trying to help other people and they want people to die. We love good people. We don't want this to happen. But now well, as the weeks have gone by, people are starting to say, okay, what's going on now? What are we doing here? I want, I, I want you to think about something for a minute. In the last five years, we have had politicians put the people to the left so far to the left and the people to the right so far to the right that we've become separated, Correct. We don't agree yeah. on any separation. They've made the white officer shooting the black person a big deal, whether it was warranted or not. So they separated the white from the black. They separated the LB, LBGTQ community from the regular community. So they separated that. So what the government has done is they've taken, they separated the nation because without unity, there's no power with the people. So now they've got us all separated. Then they come up with this COVID thing that not only separates us, but locks us down away from each other. That's government control at its finest. Separate us and confine us. That's crazy. <laughs> let, let, that mar- let that marinate for a few hours and you think <laughs> about it. They have separated right. this country so that, because I'll tell you why, we're the longest standard you know, whether you want to call it a democracy or constitutional republic, we're the longest standing one without a revolution in the history of the world. How do you stop a revolution before it starts? You separate people so there's no unity because revolutions never happen without unity. And that's exactly what they've done to us. Right. And you keep, you keep this in mind, too. I mean, the closest to it would have been the Civil War. That would have, that was the closest to it would have been the Civil War, yeah. And it was because a group of Southern states did not want to accept the results of the 1860 election. That's, exactly. what, that's what that's what did it because they, they knew when they got him and when he got in office, that was the end of their slavery institution. He was going to end it, do whatever he could to end it, and that's why they seceded from the union. It's crazy, man. It's just it's it's just. You know, when you look at it and the separation, and I went by a party yesterday, going to the store to get food, went by a party, and it was it was balloons, and there was cars, and there was people that were six feet away from each other. Everybody had a mask on. They did it correctly. But you look at that, and you're like, wow, that is the ultimate separation. Here's a family who normally would be hugging and saying, I love you, and everything else, and they can't be more than six feet uh, you know, they got to be six feet apart. They got to wear masks. They got to try to communicate that way. And I looked at that and I just said, man, you know, this is what's going on in the world today. We've been separated. We have no unity. And even when we have a get together at a family house, a family function, we still don't have any, any unity. We are as separated as a people as we have ever been. And the government setting back and uh, let's face it, Joe Biden no offense, no offense, no offense to Democrats. He's a sacrificial lamb. He's a complete moron. Bernie Sanders should have been a guy, but it's going to be Biden. 
Biden could, let me tell you about Joe Biden. If he was starving to death, he couldn't beat three eggs and throw them in a pan and feed himself. And he's running for president. I mean, if, if there's ever going to be a landslide victory for a Republican Party, it's going to be this election. And it's just, you know, it's always the lesser of two evils. That's a frustrating thing, too. You know, when was the last time we had two candidates that really went toe-to-toe, that were quality people, that put the people first, that did what they were supposed to do? I mean, it's been 50 years, you know? Now, you know what else is unifying for people? I just was, before I forget, I, I want to make this point. Sports. Sports unifies people. They completely stopped sports. They stopped even wrestling. If you think about it, everything stopped. You, you, the only thing, anytime you get sports, is you, get, you got ESPN showing the championship game years ago. Or, you know, your your local sports station is doing that. But yeah, the sports stopped completely. We're like, the, the NFL draft aired virtually, and 15 million people tuned in to watch. Because there's nothing else on. <laughs> there's not. There's yeah. not any... And you think about you think about this. This is this is what kind of bothers me a lot. Is I have a friend and actually he helped me move. He's uh, 18. He's the star quarterback of the high school. His junior, he was being scouted, uh, not just for baseball or football, but baseball. Well, this is his senior year, and the baseball season is not happening. So even though he's be, being scouted as a pitcher for the major leagues, that went down the tube. That option's gone. No prom, no graduation. Think about all the college people that are coming up. This was supposed to be their senior year, their shining year for baseball season. Baseball season's been completely wiped off the mat, man. All those people that were going to be drafted, double A, triple A, single A, whatever, or brought up to the majors from college, they're not getting that final season to shine and show how they are. So it's really powerfully affected in a negative way a lot of innocent people it really has i mean you know you think about it what's the best your senior prom is a big deal there's no senior proms this year people have paid tens of thousands of dollars for weddings that are now are going to have a virtual wedding in their living room i mean they're not getting that money back it's just insane well i just um, i guess um my nephew is getting married to his fiance sometime next year and they actually sat down and they crunched the numbers and they said well we can have a big wedding or we can put a down payment on a house and i'm like put a down payment on a house i said no said, well, we there. might go to a judge and then have the immediate family together for like a reception at my sister's house that's what they're talking about doing and i'm like perfect i said just let us know when it is i mean it's fine they just they just need you just need you need the judge Right in the groom and a witness. You got to. Yeah, that's that's all. Yeah. With a mask. Well, you that's up lift, to her. Usually, the you, may lift your mask and, you may lift your mask and kiss your bride. <laughs> yeah. Lift your mask and kiss your bride. Well, they're not doing it again for at least another year, but um, usually the weddings itself is for the bride. It's about her. For More, sure. I mean, I would have, you sure. know, that's why. You know, with Christine, when we got married, we didn't go hog wild, but we had a nice church ceremony. That, that all yeah. I have, we just do it in a church. That's all I want. I don't care what church it is. Do it in a church. Yeah. Right. So that was it. That's the only thing I asked, and they, they're fine with it. They didn't want to just go to a judge and do it. You know? But everything, yeah, the way I look back, like yeah, you, you, you missed out on your prom, you missed out on your senior year stuff. That's the best time of your life. The most. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. back. Not getting it sucks, and well, it's just I, I it, to me, and I might be wrong. I could be completely wrong. And when we first started shutting down, I'm lucky. I have a job I can work from home. Christine can still work. We still have an income. We still have that. But it felt like an overreaction. To me, it felt like an overreaction. I said, "Is this really what we're supposed to do?" Okay, we could do it. Maybe it'd be a couple of weeks. Or maybe a month. Well, that was almost two months. Ago. Well, and, you know, I, I think, I think because the fear. Of, of, of nobody knowing how contagious this was or how powerful it was to kill people. I think I think the thing was, is because this is a biological virus, basically it's germ warfare. So I think that nobody knew what was going to happen. 
I mean, were right. tens of thousands going to die, like smallpox back in the day, or, you know, uh, whatever diseases came around that wiped out millions of people? Uh, the Spanish flu of, of 1917 or 13. I mean, I don't think anybody knew anything about this. So I'm not, I, I couldn't go with the whole overreaction. I could go with the overreaction based on fear and not knowing. For sure. Yeah. It was the unknown, I think, because there was a model that came out of London um, that had two and a half million people dying, and that's what freaked everybody out. You know, like, okay, we got to do this. But you, you don't want, nobody wants to do that. And yeah. I guess now, I think uh, there, was no, there, was, there was a different number that gave us 240,000. But now, there was just a link. I think I sent it to you, too, that somebody sent me, was that the CDC adjusted their death toll for the coronavirus from 67,000 to 37,000 because they had yeah, the normal, normal flu season. Yeah. The normal well, flu was, season. Was yeah, but I guess they might have had corona-like symptoms that were being counted as it. Then they look back and they say, yeah, we don't think so. So that's what it looks like to me. So, but one reporter asked Trump, and I couldn't believe they asked, they said, do you think a president deserves to be reelected? After uh, losing the same amount of people in five weeks in the whole Vietnam War, <laughs> it was like wow, and it was, I thought wow. I mean, because sixty-five thousand men died in Vietnam, soldiers died in Vietnam. That was uh, seven or eight year conflict. History, I remember, he me But he, his response was very well. He didn't, he didn't, take, he didn't take the page. He said, "Hey, look, we don't want one death is too many. We had a model saying two and a half million. We're down to 64, 65,000. He goes, I think we're doing the best we can. And one death is too many. If I could, I'd save everybody. Or something like that, which is which is the right thing to say. Something like that. I'm not, I'm not paraphrasing. But I thought a reporter asking that type of guy. Oh, yeah. Question. Yeah. You know, really? It's, it's the toughest job in the free world being the president of the United States. And everything you do is going to be armchair quarterback by a million people a day, including the press. But at the end of the day, did you, you take every precaution you could to save lives? And, and I think that's a resounding yes, um, even though it may be an overreaction. But if you look at those early death tolls for CDC and the one that was put out in Britain about it really being, I mean, just a ridiculous death toll, I think that's how I reacted to it. Ultimately, that probably saved a lot of lives. So, you know, I mean, nobody wants to be the president with a legacy who screwed up and a half a million people died from a virus. I mean, oh, my Lord. Right. That's a terrible right. legacy to have. He's, he's human. He's a human being. He doesn't want to do it. Because I remember when I first, when this first happened, I said, I, I felt it was an overreaction. Let me, fin- let, me, let me clarify that. I said, okay, I'll do it. This feels like an overreaction, but it was like to err on the side of caution. The whole idea sure. was to make the healthcare system wasn't overrun when we did that. Healthcare right. system, it's time to start opening up. And that's, unless you're in New York. Because <laughs> there's going to be a second. Right. There's going to be right. a second. Well, you, got nine billion, okay. you got nine million people rubbing elbows every day. <laughs> well, and the way they commute, too. They're all compacted in subways and trains and buses. And they don't commute to work like we do in Ohio or in North Carolina where they're on their cars. Right. And exactly. Uh, there's more exposure. There's just more exposure. To it. So, but back to it, man. No, I pre- no, I appreciate you coming on. And this is we kind of sidetracked the conversation from talking about kayfabe to the coronavirus <laughs> and conspiracy. Hey, <laughs> but, but, but you know, it was a quick hour. It was good. Yeah, yeah, we're just about there. Good. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, we're showing your audience that wrestlers can actually be intelligent. Yeah, we, we think all we I mean we read we do all that we uh, we're, we're literate yeah uh, we can even write our own names yeah I could sign without an X it's great yeah. <laughs> My, I remember what, one time Lou, 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 one time somebody told me I had a conversation with him about uh, politics or finance and they said this you're pretty smart for a wrestler I go whatever gave you the clue that people are dumb just because the wrestlers. And he goes, I don't know. I just always assumed it. I'm like, well, I hope I changed your mind. And I really wanted to punch him, but I didn't. Yeah. I held back. There's times, there's, there's times we hold, we bite our tongues and bite our lips on things. 
Oh, and really, yeah. in today's day and age, if you beat up somebody for breaking faith, faith or you straighten them off or break faith, it's all over Twitter and you're the worst person in the world and they can't do it. When you're doing yeah, what you're supposed to. I remember yeah. when you, I remember when you jack slapped somebody in the face for for a uh, breaking kayfabe thing. All the workers to the back, and you bitch yeah. slapped. Them. Yeah, I'm like, yes. You know what? <laughs> if, if you look at the reactions I got from that, all the guys oh. that business hugged me. Yeah. Manny hugged me for doing that. Goes, oh yeah, oh yeah. Thank oh, you. Oh yeah. And then anybody in the business, is it anybody in the business that was in the business? That knew the business looked at you and said, "Thank you for doing that. Thank you for slapping yeah. him across the face, like, well, pimp slap." I put the hand for his face. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I like, no, we don't, don't do slap that. normal. We don't slap normal. We actually chop you in the face. You do not want to get slapped by a wrestler. But yeah, it's a chop in the face. Damn. Yeah. Good night. If I wanted to hurt hey, him. Man, I yeah, thanks for having me on, brother. It was good to see you. Yeah. Make sure you tell Christine and the girls we said hi. We love them. Yeah. I'll get you on my YouTube show. So, you tell Rhea and Abby I said hello. You tell Rhea and Abby I said hello. And just everybody that's listening, please click the like button, click the share button, subscribe. I appreciate everybody listening to this. Follow, what, go ahead, plug your podcast again. Plug your podcast. Uh, yeah, tonight at 8 o'clock on YouTube Live, it's Q-Ball and the Birdman. You can find us under Triple T Radio Live. Uh, everything's under the banner of Triple T Radio Live. You also get Tuesday night at 8 o'clock, we do Triple T Radio Wrestling. Uh, we have on there, we do Truth Busters now once or twice a month on there. So just go to Triple T Radio Live, and you'll find us, and you'll find all our shows. Thanks, Lou. All right, oh, thank you, guys, and thank you for listening, everybody. All right, brother. Love you, man. Love you too, brother.